Well, this morning we begin a new message series called Cross Training. And it's all about preparing ourselves and equipping ourselves to follow the call to be disciples of Jesus. I want to encourage you during this series, we've got a message handout each week. You should have received by email this morning the ministry update. And in that ministry update, we are uh, providing a link to the sermon outline and just want to encourage you. We're going to post that each Thursday each week and want to encourage you to go online and make sure to print out this outline so you can take notes and you can follow along, whether you're here uh, at Good Shepherd or if you are at home as well. So we have a verse of the month, and this is the last weekend in September. So this is the last weekend for this verse, but it's still appropriate for this new message series that we are introducing. So I want to invite you to join me in reciting these words from Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. And now we've done them for a few weeks, so even if you can, maybe try not looking at the screen and join in in reciting these words. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And that is our verse of the month for September. We pray in this prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. Jesus teaches us to pray for those laborers for the harvest. And, and who are those laborers? Those laborers are his followers. Those laborers are his disciples. And so what we are praying for, when we are praying for those laborers in the harvest, we are praying for disciples of Jesus. So I have a very pointed question for you this morning that I want you to think about and to consider as we go through this entire message series. And the question is a very simple question. The question is this. Are you, are you a disciple of of Jesus. Are you a follower of Jesus? Now, notice what I did not ask in that question. It's, it's just as important what I didn't ask as to what I asked. And what I, I didn't ask is if you are a church attender. What I didn't ask is if you are a member of the church. I didn't even ask you if you are a Christian. What I asked you is, are you a Disciple, Because depending on how you define those other things, they are not necessarily one in the same. Many people attend church for many different reasons, and it's not always about following Jesus. So the second question, this gets a little more to the heart of the first question, and the second question is this. What is it? What is it that makes you a follower of Jesus? What is it that makes you a disciple of Jesus? Put it another way. If you were put on trial, you think about the early church and, and many of the early Christians, they were arrested and thrown into prison and, and martyred because they were followers of Jesus. And if you were arrested because you were a follower of Jesus Christ, what is the evidence that would convict you? What would be the evidence that was presented at your trial? What is that distinguishes you from others that do not follow Jesus? Unfortunately, the, the sad reality in the Western church and the, the church in the United States is oftentimes that there is not very much that, that distinguishes and identifies those that claim to be followers of Jesus Christ from, from everyone else. So the question is then, well, what is, what is the evidence? What is the evidence that you are a follower of Jesus? And i share a few things with you this morning. First of all, Evidence of discipleship is, is that disciples produce fruit. Jesus spoke in, in organic terms. He talked about nature, and, and he talked about growth. 
And he says this, you will recognize them, my disciples, followers, by their, by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. And opposite of that, a diseased tree, an unhealthy tree, is, is not going to bear good fruit. But it says here it is going to bear bad fruit. Well, what is that, that fruit that, that Jesus is talking about here? Well, it, it is a, a life, the abundant life. John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. It is, is a joy-filled life. It is, is a life that is filled with contentment. It is a life that has all the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The Apostle Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He says against these things there is no such law. This is the fruit, these things here that, that the Apostle Paul lists as the fruit of the Spirit, it is the fruit of the fruit of discipleship. A second thing that discipleship and followers of Jesus produce is other disciples. Disciples produce disciples. It is in Acts chapter 9, verse 31 where Luke describes the early church as multiplying. The disciples made other disciples. Now, here's the thing, going back to the, the previous, you know, the disciples bear fruit. Are you living such a life that you would want for others? Are you living such a life that is worth reproducing are you living such in such a way that what you are doing that it would be good for others to emulate that and imitate that and follow along to follow your example that you set the third thing a third thing that disciples produce is that disciples produce transformation do you think the world needs changing? Do you think we need change in this world? Uh, the thing about that is that you're either the prob part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And the change in this world, the change that this world needs, it starts with you. And it starts with me. One person at a time. I can't change the world unless first Christ changes me. You think about Jesus and no one changed the world in quite the way that Jesus did. But you think about what Jesus focused on. Jesus did not focus on everyone. Who did he focus on? He focused on just a few, 12 individuals. Yet it was through those 12 individuals that, that we cannot deny that he influenced this world greater than anyone ever influenced this world. Transformation, it starts with you and me. And the question is, is how, how am I being changed? How am I being transformed? How am I growing as a disciple? How am I increasing in my ability to follow Jesus each and every day? And as we're confronted with these things, we may be thinking to yourself that, well, I'm not quite the follower of Jesus that I thought I was. And we have all kinds of excuses as to why we do not engage in discipleship. One of those, probably the most common excuse is, well, no time. I just don't have the time. But here's the thing you need to know. Discipleship is, is not another thing. 
It's not another thing to put on to your calendar. But, but rather, discipleship changes what we do and how we go about doing it. It's not about adding another thing, but it, it's about the way we engage in what we are already, already doing. We have more choices before us today. We have more information before us today than at any point in time ever in history. And so often it's so difficult to sort it out and to figure it out and to make those choices. But think of discipleship as a filter. It is a filter through which we are able to sort out all that the, our society bombards us with. Another thing about this excuse we make of, of having no time is that, well, maybe your busyness, your being too busy, feeling stretched that you're running here and you're running there and never seemingly able to accomplish that much, maybe your busyness is about the question of your discipleship. And maybe you are so busy, too busy, because you're not submitting to Christ and not following him with the way that you prioritize your schedule and your calendar. Another reason why discipleship doesn't happen is, well, because there's no plan. There's no plan. Uh, Maybe what I'm talking about here today is, is foreign to you. As you're, you're hearing what I'm talking about, you're, you're, not even, you're not sure, well, what should I be doing? Well, the thing is, is if we have a calling upon us from Jesus or from anyone else, and it's important, if it's truly important, we're going to take whatever it takes to figure it out and to make it happen. For a lot of us, though, our discipleship is, is more often wishful thinking than, than anything else. You know, we, we show up at church, maybe we attend a Bible study, we put a little bit of money in the offering plate maybe, and we volunteer a little bit of our time, and we hope that discipleship happens. But the thing is about discipleship is that discipleship is very intentional. And it takes planning and it takes prioritization. And one of the goals that, that I have for all of us here today is that by the end of the series, that each of us would have a written plan, a written course of action that we would engage in in the process of discipleship. You think about New Year's resolutions. And so often we make New Year's resolutions and, and we, we, after a short time, a very short time, we often stumble and fall and don't follow through with those. Well, why is that? Because those things more often than not are just simply wishful thinking and we don't necessarily have a plan to implement those resolutions and to fulfill those resolutions in our life. A third reason why discipleship doesn't happen is, well, it's just, it's just too hard, right? It's just too hard. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, is it's not easy. If it was easy, then, then everybody would be doing it. But what does Jesus say? He says here in Luke chapter 13, he says, work Work what? Work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom. For many will try to enter it, but will fail. And there are so many distractions in this world. There are, are so many things that are, are, are going to work towards us losing our focus and cause us to, to drift. You just think about the scriptures and opening up the Bible. I'm going to be talking more about the Bible next week. And yes, the Bible is a big, thick book. Yes, the Bible 
is not an easy book to understand. It is a difficult book to understand. But the things that are most important in life are often the most difficult things in life. Jesus never promised that it was going to be easy. He says what? Take up. He says, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. There is a cost. There is a cost to discipleship of our, our time, of our energy, of our mind, of our resources, of our money. Discipleship is not easy. Uh, I came across this uh, quote the other day. It says, the truth about discipleship is that it's never hip. It's never in style. It is the call to come and die. It's a long obedience in the same direction. That last line hit me there. It's a long obedience. It's not just a passing fad. It's not something just to engage in simply for a week, to take a Bible study, a course, a class, and then I'm done. It's a lifelong endeavor of commitment and recommitment. As you think about discipleship, you know, we, we think about growth that sometimes is as a straight line, a linear line that I'm growing each and every day. But the truth of the matter is I, I maybe grow a little bit and then I stumble, I lose my focus, I regress. But then I, the thing is, is I, 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 with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm able to recommit. And even though I took two steps forward, I can take now five steps, or I took two steps backwards, I can take five steps forward. Martin Luther says a Christian's life is one of repentance. A whole Christian's life is one of repentance. And there is constant renewal and constant recommitment that we make to the task of discipleship and following, following Jesus. Uh, one other thing here, why discipleship doesn't happen, is that you can't do it alone. We pride ourselves as American people as being self-made. You know, one of the most popular sections in the bookstore is self-help books. We pride ourselves in being self-reliant and not needing anybody else. But the course of discipleship is not something that I can do on my own. Primarily, first and foremost, I need the help of the Holy Spirit. I need the help of God. Jesus promises to send us the Holy Spirit who is described as, as the helper. And discipleship is in many ways learning total dependence upon God. But not only depending upon the Holy Spirit, but also living interdependent of one another as well. I've shared this with you before. Everyone needs their Paul. Everyone needs their Barnabas. Everybody needs their Timothy. And your Paul is this. Your Paul is someone who is teaching you. Your Paul is someone who is mentoring you. Your, your Paul is someone who is where you want to go or need to go, and you learn from them how they got to where they got. You also need your peers, and those are your Barnabases on the journey. Those who are walking alongside together with you that you can encourage one another support one another and hold each other accountable who is walking with you on the path of discipleship and if you're like many church-going americans you're walking it alone you don't have anyone that can take that 3 a.m phone call for you who would you call at 3 a.m in the morning if you needed to talk who would be there to answer that call. You also need your Timothy, and that is someone that you're teaching, someone that you're instructing. We all have something to offer, and you want to know the best way to learn something, the best way to grow in something is to teach it to others. And I want to encourage you today that when you go home, I want you to think about what you learned, what you took away from this message, and I want you to share it with someone else. How you can instruct, maybe it's your children, 
Maybe your, your spouse, maybe a, a friend, or if you're on internet and, and you're on social media, you can share something in a, a post that you make. But you need to teach because disciples, followers of Jesus, if we're to emulate Christ and follow Christ's example, we need to do the things that he did. And teaching was one of the things that he did. I'm going to end with this. Discipleship is the engine that drives the church. We can talk all day about the mission of the church and the things that God has called us to do and what is it that makes a successful church and makes that church that makes a difference in the world. It is a church that is a discipling church. That is the engine that drives the church. But unfortunately, the church in America often looks like this. It's a car, right? But it's not a car that is going anywhere. It doesn't function like a car. It looks like a car, but it doesn't function as a car should function or do the things that a car should be able to do because what is missing? It's missing its engine. And a church that is not a discipling church, a Christian who is not being discipled is much, much like that car. Now, as I said, there are many things that distract us from discipleship. Even though this is our main mission, even though this is our highest calling as believers, we get distracted by everything that seems so urgent, especially in times of pandemics. And we make it all about church and we make our lives all about so many other things. We tend to drift. And the devil will do anything he can do to distract us from this mission. Churches typically focus on attendance, how many people are in the pews, how much money is in the offering plate. And we measure our success based upon those things. And maybe as an individual, you measure success by many other things other than discipleship in your life. But our mission, our goal as a church is not necessarily a bigger church, but a bigger heaven. Most churches are about building a bigger church we want more people, but more people does not necessarily mean that we're accomplishing the mission of the church. We may be accomplishing our mission, but we're not accomplishing God's mission. Jesus is not, account, is not counting attendance. He's not counting our budget. He's not counting our buildings. He is counting the disciples that we are making. And when we pray that God's kingdom would come, we are praying that disciples would be made. As I said, we tend to drift as churches. We tend to drift as individuals. Growth never looks like that straight line. And when we drift, we need to realign ourselves. And that's the invitation that I want to give to you during this message series to participate, even if you miss a Sunday, to go back and watch these messages as we're going to be talking about the different marks of discipleship and developing that plan for discipleship. So as we enter into this uh, message series, we're going to be laying the foundation uh, for what's coming next in 2021 uh, January. Let's get past 2020, okay? Would you, would you all be agree that would be a good thing? As we move past this year, as we enter into 2021, we're going to be introducing a, a new mission for our congregation. Our vision team worked very hard, and we had hoped to introduce that vision this fall, but because of pandemics and all of that, it got pushed back a little bit. So we're going to be introducing a, a new vision this coming uh, winter in January, and it is all about discipleship. And so this message series, in many ways, is going to be laying the foundation for that. But I pray that my, part of my prayer today is, is that, that this would have been a hard message to hear. 
uh, that you were maybe indeed convicted in your own walk and your own discipleship. And as they talk about recommitment, uh, you know, the, the good news is, is that there's always a new start. There's always that opportunity to make that recommitment. So I want to invite you to join me and together let's recommit to the task, the calling of Jesus and the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. So let's do this together. Let's stand up and let's make our confession uh, together. Lord Jesus, you have called me to follow you. This demands that I would deny myself and take up my cross. And while I say I will follow you, I become reluctant and make excuses. I say I don't have the time. I am not intentional in the choices I make. I give up when it is too hard, and I try to do too much on my own. Forgive my hypocrisy and lack of commitment to the highest calling I have in this life. Send your spirit upon me to reignite my passion and to recommit myself to being your disciple. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us, and it is for his sake that he forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God unto you, the forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you.